Good evening. I talked Wednesday night about the, the thing and our path walking with God. I want to keep going with that just a little bit. And I want to go over a couple verses that we did before. If you will go with me to Job 23, verse 10. I read this on Wednesday night. And this is Job speaking, but it's God he's talking about. But he knoweth the way that I take. When he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. We have a path that we walk with God. We have a path of righteousness. And that path doesn't start until we're born again. And when we're born again, then we endeavor to, to obey the gospel, to walk in the gospel. Well, when that happens, God takes us on. And he leads us down a path. And that's what he's talking about here. Job's talking about, he said, but you know what the way that I take? When he has tried me, he shall, I shall come forth as gold. We're tried. Our faith is tried. You know, Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. He gives us our faith. You know, our faith is a gift. He gives us the faith to be born again. Otherwise, we wouldn't be born again. He gives us the faith to do anything that he has in our path to do. Let's go to... Proverbs 25. I'm going to read verse 4. Verse 4. Take away the dross from the silver, and there shall come forth a vessel for the finer. Wednesday night I shared with you about growing up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and the iron, the, uh, the iron factories, the steel factories. And both of my grandparents and my dad, both, uh, all three of them worked in the steel, steel mills. And how you take the iron ore and you put it to the fire. And that iron ore begins to melt. And everything that is usable, the iron, goes to the bottom. And everything that is not usable rises to the surface. And you skim it away. And you keep skimming it away. It's the same thing with gold. You take gold ore. And if you've ever seen real gold ore, it doesn't look like gold. It doesn't look bright or anything. But you put it in the fire and you, you put the fire to it. And it begins to melt. And what happens is that gold, as it's melting, all that's what's called the dross, everything that is unusable, everything that is worthless, rises to the surface. And the miner, the, the person in that factory, skims off that dross. And then he heats it more. And then more of that dross comes to the surface and he skims it off. That's what happens when we walk with God. We are put to the fire. It says what? Uh, don't be surprised at the fiery trial that is to try you. Well, that's the fire. Our faith is being tried. Let's go to the next verse. Proverbs, let's see, it's Proverbs 8, 20. This is wisdom speaking. Wisdom is Jesus. I lead in the way of righteousness in the midst of the paths of judgment. I lead, Jesus leads in the way of righteousness in the midst of the paths of judgment. Now we're on this path, and I, I, I shared with you about you're, you're walking down this path, and, and this thing arises. You're trying to obey God. You're trying to walk in that gospel, and you start believing, and it seems like the moment you set your faith to believe, this thing happens. Now, it could be uh, a spirit in you or that you're dealing with. It could be some, it's, it's something in your heart, and it's right there. The moment you start to try to believe, it's right there. Well, that's, that's the dross coming to the surface. Now, what do you do with it? This is where we turn to Hebrews 14. This is one of my favorite passages in the Bible, and yes, I have more than one favorite, but... I'm going to begin in verse 9, though. He said, then he said, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. This is Jesus. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. The first covenant that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and oftentimes the same sacrifice which can never take away sins. But this man, Jesus 
after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. And this is the verse I want to get to. For by one offering, he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. By one offering, he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. What was the offering? Jesus died, and he was buried, and he rose again. And what happened with that one offering? He made us perfect. I love the way the NIV says, the NIV says, for by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Those that are being made holy. So, this, so what do you do when you are walking this path and these things come up, these situations, these feelings? You do what this verse says. By one sacrifice, thou hast been made perfect. You know, you, you preach yourself the gospel. You put the problem, the thing, whatever it is in your way, you bring it to the gospel. I'll give an example. God was dealing, frankly, at the time with pride. And this is one of the first trials, one of the first fires I got put into. It was back in 1990. I had two children. I was in my 30s. I was working at Albert's, um, I was working at a grocery store that had 500 other grocery stores. And I was one of the sign makers. God got me the job there. Absolutely. By the Spirit of God, got me the job. Great job. Worked my own hours. Believed God brought in the money that I needed. I would work the hours that I needed because I trusted God for the exact amount of hours that I needed. And in the Metroplex, there were a hundred of these stores. They had two people that they considered the best sign makers in the Metroplex. I was one of them. And then there was another gentleman. The other gentleman, I thought, did much better than I did, but they thought I did wonderful. This was important when you were in a grocery store because when the big wigs came from the corporate office, you had to look good. Well, if you had a good sign maker and those signs are all over the store, it made you look even better. So I was well liked. So one day, the, the store manager comes to me and says, Kathy, I want you to take a walk with me out in the parking lot. No problem. I go out in the parking lot. We get out away from the store, and he says... I just got a memo in the corporate office, 500 stores, remember 500 grocery stores. He said, the corporate office just sent us a memo. There are no more signed positions ever done. Your job has been eliminated now. So in one moment, I totally lost my job. Totally. He said, at first he said, I don't know what you want to do. He said, you can, if you, if, if you want, you can stay and be a cashier, but I can't do that for a couple of weeks. So the only thing I can think of that you can do now between now and then is you can be a bagger, a bagger. You know, I learned one thing from Doyle. I learned you don't run. I learned that when he would share about Argyle, you don't run. This was a fire to me because frankly, I had a family to feed. My husband and I both had to work, and now I can't leave here. You know, I realized a little later there would have been any grocery store in the Metroplex would have taken me because I had a reputation of being really good at hand-lettering these signs. But I knew I couldn't run, so I became a bagger, a bagger. I'm a 30-something bagger, and the other baggers are 16 and 15. So I bagged for two weeks. You know, I would cart those those bags out there in the, in the buggy, and, and there were several times where there were big, big old cowboys. I mean, we're talking 6'3", big boots, big truck, and they would watch me take those groceries, their groceries out, and I'd get to this big truck, and they would just stand there and stare at me. And I would have to climb up on the truck with the bags, put them in, climb down, get some more grocery bag, climb up. And I'm looking at the guy going, really? Really? And do it again and do it. And they just sit there and smile. You know, I was in the fire. I was in the fire. A couple weeks later, I did become a grocery clerk. 
And when I did that, I at least got the same money that, or close to the same money as I was doing, doing the signs. I become a clerk, a, a grocery clerk. Now, the only problem with that was the front end manager, I'm 30 something, the front end manager's 18 years old and, and she's not the sweetest thing on this earth. In fact, she acted like a little punk, frankly. And so one day I'm trying to do what I'm supposed to do. I'm just learning this. And she told me to do something, so I go around to do it, and, and then I guess I did it wrong because she starts screaming in front of all the cu customers. She's yelling at me. I turned around to go back to my register, and out of my mouth came this. I didn't go to college for this. You know what? I knew at that very moment what I was doing there. I knew exactly what I was doing in this fire. Pride. Pride. I didn't go to college for this. You know, I didn't think that my college degree was such a big deal. To me, it was just, it was just a means to an end. I wanted to be a teacher, and the only way back then you could be a teacher was you had to go to college. You know, I had some college friends that would sign their name, Mary Smith, BS. Really? <laughs> yeah. I didn't do that. I didn't, but I saw there was pride. So what was, the, what was I going to do? I had to humble myself. I had to humble myself. I worked that job. And you know what? That fire got worse. It got worse. And my husband ended up coming home one day and saying, Kathy, my schedule's all changed. He said, you can't work at the grocery store like you do. He said, and, and we need you to work, so we're going to have to find something else for you to do. You know what happened? Just so happened that that day that the third weekend third shift woman had to quit. Third shift, Friday night and Saturday night. She quit. I knew it. I knew it. I had to take the job. You know what? I needed the money. We needed the money for groceries. I humbled myself. I took the job. You know, that, that job, I worked Friday night from 11 to 7 a.m., and I worked Saturday night, 11 to 7. Not too bad, except my husband worked, watched the children in the afternoon, then he went to work. When, when I did that, I didn't sleep. So I really didn't sleep Friday till Sunday afternoon after church. I, it was more than 24 hours. I maybe got an hour in, but I had to work. You know what? I was in the fire, and you know who put me there? God. God. I had to humble myself. You know, that was the one job I've ever had that I hated. I hated. I didn't think I had any hate in me, but you know what that fire did? You know what the fire did? It brought it to the surface. That was the only job I ever had that I finally said, I hate this job. I hate it. That was the fire bringing it to the surface. What do you do with it? You take it to the gospel. You take it to the gospel. And I remember standing 3 o'clock in the morning in the store thinking, I hate this job. And then one morning, I had to, it was a Saturday, it was a Saturday evening, and I was getting ready. I was driving to the store, and I said it out loud. I said, Father, I hate this job. I hate it. And he said, I know. That's why you're here. And then he said something to me. He said, if you will thank me for this job, if you will thank me, for this job, I will get you out. You know what my response was? Watch my dust. Watch my dust. Actually, he said, if you will believe me, I will get you out of this job. I said, watch my dust. And I knew I had to thank God in the fire. I had to thank God for the fire. I had to thank God I was in the middle of the fire. You know what? When I first did this, I opened my mouth to thank God for the job. I couldn't. I couldn't. I couldn't thank, you don't know what buys groceries at 3.30 in the morning. I mean, they come out of the woodwork. And I had to call the police for the people that were stealing beer and the people that would work in the store. These, hood, these hoodlum kids would come in to mess around and I would go get the big, the, the stalkers, the big stalkers. I'd say, we got these kids over here messing with the, the, I think that back then it was the whipped cream. They loved to mess around with the whipped cream. I said, we got these kids over there. And they'd say, you handle it. We're not going to. 
I said, you're 6'3", you're stalkers, I'm this. Well, it's not our job, you do it. I'd have to go deal with the teenagers. I'd have to throw them out of the store. I'd have to call the police. I'd have to, people would steal beer. I'd have to call the police. I hated the job. I couldn't thank him. I couldn't at the time thank him. But I found something I could do. I started. I said, I thank you for the $86.35 that this weekend gets me because that's all our groceries for the week. I said, I thank you. I want to thank you for the $86.35 that this job produces because it feeds my family. You know what? I kept doing that, and I could finally say, I thank you for this job. I thank you that I have a job. I thank you that I make money that I can actually feed my children. And I thanked him any way I could think of thanking him for that job. And you know what? You know what? Not not too many days after, I think it was one more weekend, I was there picking up my check, and the, the, the store manager says, Kathy, would you come out in the parking lot with me? I want to talk to you. And I thought, oh, God. Oh, God. You know, I learned a long time ago, don't ever say it's gonna, it can't get any worse than it is. Don't ever say that. Don't ever say that. I walked out in the parking lot with him. We got about halfway back, and he turned to me, and he goes, you're not going to believe this. You are not going to believe this. He said, I got a memo from the corporate office. He said, all the jobs have been reinstated immediately. Immediately. I don't know if God was dealing with 500 other sign makers in the company, but he did that all to deal with me, to put me in the fire. And when I was in the fire, all that pride came to the surface. All that unthankfulness, that selfishness, there in that situation came to the surface. And how did you deal with it? You dealt with it in that Jesus died and he was buried and he rose again for me and he bore my pride and he bore my rebellion and he bore my selfishness and he bore all this. What does Hebrews say? By one sacrifice, he has perfected forever them that are being made holy. And I got everything back, everything back that I had lost before the fire. Everything. And you know what happened right after that? Another store called and said, Kathy, would you do our signs too? And another store called and said, Kathy, would you do our signs too? And another store called. I had four stores. And then after I got the four stores, one of the managers came up to me and said, Kathy, they are opening up all these new warehouses, eight of them. He said, they need a sign company. I want you to bid for it. I said, I can't, Tom. I, I don't have the staff. He said, you'll get the staff. I want you to bid for it. I said, I can't. I don't have the equipment. He said, Kathy, you'll get the equipment. I know you can do this. I want you to bid for it. I did, and I got it. And that's where my sign business started, was with all those eight stores eight stores, one after another, God put me there. Why? Because I made it through the fire. You know, Hebrews, I want you to turn to Hebrews 13. There's one verse that just came up. When we're in that fire, oh, verse, I'm sorry, Hebrews 12. It says, I'm going to begin in verse 12. It says, wherefore lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. And make straight paths for your feet, that that which is lame may be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. That it says, make straight paths for your feet, lest that which be lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Stay in the fire. Stay in the fire. Let what God needs to deal with, let him deal with it. Let it burn. Let it burn. You know, there was a situation not long back that somebody told me I, that there was something I needed to do that, frankly, I thought was the most demeaning thing I have ever seen, heard, or whatever. I thought it was the most disrespectful thing that I was asked to do ever, and it got to a point where I said, I'm not going to do it. I said, I am not going to bend over that far. I'm not going to go that far underneath my dignity and do this. I said, you are, th this situation is the most disrespectful situation I have ever seen. And I walked away and I got in the car and I was driving away. 
And then I thought, what if this is back in the fire? And I said this, what if this is the one thing, the one thing that keeps you from the kingdom of God? What if this is the one thing that keeps you from obtaining the kingdom of God, the power of God? I said, it's not worth it. It is not worth it. And then I remember, uh, God brought a verse to my memory. He said, Jesus, Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame. And I turned around and I said, okay, okay. You know what? It's one of the reasons why I'm standing up here. 